Now this next lecture is on guinea, excuse me, on hamsters and it's a shorter lecture. I didn't realize that uh, I was over two hours for this and it's my fault for not pointing that out is the guinea pig usually runs longer than the hamster. And uh, I'm going to use the same format as I did with the guinea pig, the infectious diseases first, the parasitic diseases, then the meta metabolic conditions, and finally miscellaneous uh, conditions in hamsters. And again, I'd like to preface this presentation by saying that much of the material that I've got has been given to me by people who have published papers and otherwise have good collections of gross and gross material as well as glass slides or photomicrographs. And I thank you. I'm going to start this presentation by just reviewing a little bit of the basic uh, uh, anatomy of hamsters. I, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of this. Some of you are probably not. That's why I want to cover this. There are, mul there are several different types of hamsters. The common one is the Syrian hamster, which is pictured here. It's about six inches long, has a short tail, black beady eyes, and, uh, dark ears, and they can be any color. This is a typical color, but they can be any color. They can be albino as well. They're all Syrian. This is the Chinese hamster or the gray hamster or the striped hamster. It's significantly shorter, as you can see here. It's gray and it has this dorsal black streak down its back. The genetics differs considerably between those two. The Syrian hamster has a diploid chromosome number 44, whereas the Chinese hamster is half of that, 22. And because of this fact, these are often used in cytogenetic studies. The Syrian hamster has uh, very large cheek pouches, which are lateral evaginations of the buccal wall. They go way back up into the dorsal cervical area. They can be averted, which is very fortunate. You can do it by instrumentation, obviously, after they're anesthetized, or you can actually evert these with your fingers. There's a paper in Lab Animal Science, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, where they, they talked about how you could do that in a conscious animal. And here's an example. This animal's obviously been anesthetized to demonstrate how big these cheek pouches are. And here's one that's being inverted here. Again, it's been anesthetized. And these cheek pouches are very important in medical research because these are immunologically privileged sites. You can transplant tumors there, and the animal does not reject them for at least an extended period of time. And there's, I think there's a difference in the lymphatic system as well associated with these cheek pouches. But uh, because of these cheek pouches, transplantation has been done, and that's how we got a big disease problem here uh, 15, 20 years ago where a lot of people got infected with the LCM virus because the hamsters or the tumors that were implanted in the hamsters had the virus and people got infected and got sick by handling these animals. The other thing about hamsters, could I be focused a bit, Joe, is that they have these hip glands. This is a male, excuse me, a female hamster here and a male. In the male, they're larger, they're pigmented. See the black linear structure here, one over here? They're also present in the female, but they're not as prominent. These are hip glands. They are modified sebaceous glands. They apparently are involved in the sexual cycles and arousal systems in these animals. Uh, they, I think, secrete more material when the animal is in uh, sexual activity or females in estrus. And apparently they cause an irritation of the area because animals will go after that. They will bite at it. And in fact, I, when I was at AFIP, a practitioner had a client come in with a pet hamster who was going after that area. He was unaware of these glands, looked at it, saw the black area there, and biopsied it. Sur took a surgical specimen, sent it to us, thinking it was an abnormality. So it pays to be aware of these structures. It pays to be aware of these structures in all animal species you deal with, like with the rats, with the different kinds of glands they have. Uh, you should uh, take some time to learn the anatomy of the species you're working with. A lot of investigators are always surprised to find out that they thought they knew the animal species they worked with, but they didn't. But anyway, these are hip glands, and you can get neoplasms of these glands as well. Modified sebaceous glands, and I don't have a microscopic picture of it with me here. The other thing is the, there's a very prominent uh, non-glandular stomach. This is the esophagus here. This is the non-glandular stomach. There's a very sh uh, sharp demarcation between the, the non-glandular and then the glandular stomach right here, and then the duodenum goes down. Be aware of this sharp constriction. And hamsters also have a unipapillate kidney, 
with a very long papilla that goes way down. You can see how long it is. And this is of interest to renal physiologists who sometimes uh, cannulate individual tubules in these animals. Getting on with some of the conditions, disease conditions, uh, this is a list of pathogens that have been reported, bacterial pathogen reported in hamsters, a very impressive list of organisms. But I'd like to point out that a lot of these really don't occur that often. Salmonellosis, uh, it's been reported in textbooks that they get salmonellosis much like I described it in the guinea pig. But in, in reality, that may be true, but there's only one definitive report in the literature of a very unique presentation of salmonellosis, and I'll show that to you in a bit. So it may be that hamsters do get salmonellosis. It may be that it's, off, it's sometimes like we see in other animal species, and sometimes it's much different. And when you think of salmonella, what I would recommend you think about, you think about the liver and spleen as kind of like the filters of the body. And with a lot of infections, including salmonella, the animal gets the infection through the GI tract, the organism goes to the liver and spleen, and those, those organs are responsible for clearing the animal of that infection. And if it's a long-term thing with a low-level pathogen, you will see an increase in size. Hepatosplenomegaly tells me I'm dealing with a low-level pathogen that's in there and the body's trying to rid the organism and uh, there's a battle going on. There are more cells going to those organs to do battle. If the, uh, it's a high pathogen, they'll die too quickly. And so hepatosplenomegaly is a very important thing. And think of salmonella in that respect, like it compared with guinea pigs and other species of animals. There are many kinds of salmonella, and some are much more pathogenic than others. Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, uh, I think there's one report of this. I believe it caused abscesses between the eyes and the nose and for radiated animals, for example. Streptococcus, uh, a few reports. Diplococcal pneumonia, a few reports. Pastorella, all of these are just a few reports. Same with actinomyces, I think you're due literature. Uh, one of them, they tied off the salivary gland ducts and got uh, actinomyces infection in the salivary glands. Uh, so we go down this list. And we have individual reports of these, and that's the whole thing about hamsters, is that there really hasn't been much reported. Are they that resistant to these infections, or is it the fact that we're just not publishing the definitive reports? And I think it's probably both. Now we get into E. coli. Now E. coli is an important one in hamsters because, first of all, it was implicated as being the cause of one of the most important diseases of hamsters, and that being this atypical ileal hyperplasia, which I'll spend a lot of time on with you. But E. coli was thought to be involved in that, and it probably is a copathogen uh, in a lot of enteridides in hamsters. The problem in hamsters are the enteridides, the enteric infections, and I'll spend a lot of time on those today because they are the problem. With the guinea pigs, the big problem was bacterial infections. Hamsters, it's uh, enteric infections and mostly bacterial. Bacillus piliformis or Clostridia piliformis can be a problem. Uh, Campylobacter species, wow. We can talk probably three hours about Campylobacter in hamsters. And Clostridium difficile, which is a hot one right now. Uh, lots of people are finding this. You know, it used to be associated with antibiotic administration to hamsters. And it was an animal, <coughs> animal model for disease in people. Well, now all of a sudden we're seeing this in natural conditions. And I just went. Uh, colleague of mine here, Laura's here, we just had an outbreak of this at the facility in Chicago where I think there were maybe 40 animals that were involved that died in a research project. And it didn't jeopardize the project, but it was close to doing it at one time. So all of a sudden, Clostridium is popping up as a natural disease entity in hamsters. So I'm going to be talking about some of these selectively. Salmonellosis, again, this can present like the guinea pig, where you get the same pathogenesis, you get uh, small areas of necrosis with inflammation, liver and spleen, they grow up to be abscesses or, or granulomas and rupture and can cause systemic disease and animal die. But the other thing about it is, is the unique condition reported in the 1950s by Dr. Ennis, I believe it was, of phlebothrombosis. And this was caused by what he called Salmonella enteritidis then, which is Salmonella enteritidis, cerevar enteritidis. And what he saw was animals that had red splotches in the lungs, they had uh, foci of hemorrhage and white spots in the liver, and I think the kidneys were also involved. And microscopically, what he saw was phlebothrombosis. He fall, found thrombi in many vessels. And this is a, pic, a piece of lung from that, one of those animals. 
And right here, there is a very hypercellular area. It looks like an upside down V. Here's a hypercellular area, one right here, one right here. It looks like there's some edema in the alveolar spaces, maybe a little bit of hemorrhage here, some hemorrhage here, and the septa are thickened around here. So there's interstitial, there's congestion, more blood than there should be, hemorrhage outside of vessels, interstitial pneumonia, i.e. the interstitium is thickened, and then these hypercellular areas which are thrombed by in venules. And this is a higher magnification of that, a medium-sized venule right here, very thin wall. And here is where it's ruptured through. This is an actual rupture. This is not a uh, tributary coming off. There's no muscular wall here. And it's packed with fibrin, which contains many enmeshed cells, most of which are neutrophils, and some of which are degenerating or necrotic. There are fragments of nuclei present here. This is called phlebothrombosis. Phlebo, the vein, thrombosis, fibrin. And it ruptured through the wall. And here's some more of it over here. There are neutrophils in here but very unique, and this was seen in the initial outbreak. They made an isolation, they re-inoculated hamsters and got the same thing. And these thrombi were also seen in the livers of these animals, so it's a very unique presentation of it. Don't know if it's been seen since, though. Don't know that at all. No one's published that it has been. Staphylococcal infections, uh, I told you that they occur in the, in the guinea pig, usually as a result of trauma where you get pododermatitis, dermatitis, arthritis, things like that. Same thing can happen in the hamster. And in this particular case, this is in the uh, cheek pouch area, in the skin. Here's the skin of an animal right here. The dermis is greatly thickened. And we see a blue area here. Then we see kind of pockets of hypercellular. Actually, these are pockets of neutrophils. A pocket right here, pocket of neutrophils here, one down here. Abundant fibrous connective tissue that courses through in between these areas and separates some of them. Others are coalescing. What I want to show you here are these very basophilic structures that are present in some of these. And here are two of them next to each other, a pocket of neutrophils right here, this basophilic structure, fibrous connected tissue, proliferation here, down here, and another pocket of neutrophils next door with one of these structures. These are botryoid granules. This is another example of Splendore hepli. This is the classic botryoid granule. We always think of staphylococcal infections with botryoid granules. But I showed you a botryoid granule caused by Pseudomonas before. So things don't always, these can, bacteria don't read the, the book. They can do what they want to do. And again, what this is is antigen antibody, lots of bacteria here, lots of antibody here, and cellular breed that's incorporated in there. Actinomyces species infection. This was the one where they irradiated the animal. No, excuse me, this is the one where they ligated the duct. And so we're in the salivary gland here. And what we see are pockets of neutrophils, one right here, they're actually contiguous to each other, one right here, and one right here. You can say this is one big pocket of neutrophils with three granules. These are the classic sulfur granules that we see in cattle that have actinobacillosis or actinomycosis. But the same thing has occurred here in this hamster. Nice sulfur granules. These are much larger than we're seeing. Again, these are Splendori hepli. And the blue here represents uh, the organism, even on this H&E. And what's, what's nice here is now we have a gram stain, and look at how many organisms are present in the sulfur granule. And you can see the nice little clubbing. See the club goes up here, one here, one here, one here. There are a bunch of them. This is classic. You could not separate this from a cattle condition. Sulfur granules seen in actinomyces infection and the nice gram-positive organisms here. Bacillus piliformis, this is present in some colonies on a sporadic basis. Uh, first two in this country right here next door in Georgetown, Dr. Zook lent me these slides. He had it in both uh, Syrian hamsters and in Chinese hamsters. I think he had like 40 or 50 animals per group, but I'm not sure the mortality was like 30%, I believe, something like that. Uh, anyway, the animal typical presentation was staining of the perineal area. And you know the old thing, wet tail. I'll talk about wet tail. Wet tail is basically feces, liquid feces around the perineum or perineal area. And we always thought of one disease condition years ago. Well, now that is applicable to four or five different etiologies. And Bacillus piliformis is one of those. So we see this kind of staining. The animals were typically sick, you know, huddled, uh, lethargic, anorexic, adipsic, lost weight, uh, hair coat is disheveled hair coat, things like that. But what was commonly seen in these animals 
was a greatly dilated hemorrhagic bowel. And I'm not even sure which loops we're looking at here, but this is one big loop of bowel right here, greatly distended, five, six, eight X normal, with uh, congested blood vessels, very reddened. Even the other, uh, this is small intestine here, is greatly dilated as well. I think this is the glandular, non-glandular stomach right here. It contained a very watery yellow mucoid material. This is liver from one of those hamsters, demonstrating multiple white spots. And like I said before, multiple white spots in the liver or spleen, you should think of necrosis and inflammation. But tissue disease is an exception because oftentimes there's not much inflammation. Not much inflammation. That's a very helpful thing to help you differentiate it from other bacterial infections. This is a microscopic section of that liver showing coagulative necrosis. What this means is the cells are dead and dying, but they have not been washed away. And you can still recognize this. If you cut this out and put it on a glass slide, you can still recognize this as liver. If you can recognize a dead area as an anatomic organ, then you can call it coagulative necrosis. One here, one over here. Now, there are some inflammatory cells in here that are undergoing necrosis, but this one here is very nice. And this is typical of tissues. And there aren't many diseases that do that, diseases that cause necrosis without. Some ischemic processes I told you about, herpes in monkeys, fusobacteria in cattle, things like that. So this is coagulative necrosis right here, and there, is, there are some inflammatory cells. Now, the organisms that you want to demonstrate are around the periphery in, in uh, viable hepatocytes. And here is a, another section. This is stained with fluid and blue, a different stain. And these are necrotic cells here. And within the cytoplasm of this hepatocyte, you can see these long, slender, parallel bundles of, of filamentous organisms. And here's a nice prep here. This is a touch prep stained with a diff quick. It's a commercial preparation where he did an impression smear on a glass slide and dried it, put the stain on there, and you can see these wispy, long filamentous organisms in the cytoplasm of the hepatocyte. These are red blood cells here. And these, this is a heart from one of the guinea pig, or hamsters, and it's very abnormal. There's no scale here, but it is a typically sized one, but it's abnormal because there's a bulge here, a bulge here, and a bulge here as well. And I think there are three or four hamsters that had only this kind of lesion, which is unique to have only a heart lesion like this. Normally what happens is, as I said before, it's a triad. Think of the distal ileum, the cecum, and the anterior colon as the primary site of infection. Then the organism will go by the portal circulation to the liver. And oftentimes what you do is you see the organism in the liver, but you can't find it in the gut. And maybe it's because you're not at the right anatomical site, but it's not oftentimes demonstrated in the bowel and to see the organisms there as well. But what's unique is that we, don't, we didn't see it in the liver either, we saw it in the heart. So in this particular case, it may have bypassed the liver completely and went right directly to the heart by the circulation. But this is a very dramatic lesion in that this is the <coughs> ventricular space right here, epicardial space right here, and the wall is greatly thickened by an inflammatory infiltrate and lots of edema. We have a lot of edema right in here, and there's an admixture of cells in here. It's macrophages, lymphocytes, and neutrophils, and it kind of forming vague granulomas. You know, granulomas are layered. Usually you have at least a center core and a rim. And some of these you can say, well, they're de fairly well delineated. I can't really be sure I could see a center. So I call them vague granulomas, because there's no better term to use. And I think there are probably enough macrophages here to classify it as a granuloma, but there are a lot of neutrophils as well. And the, the myocytes are basically indiscernible in this area. They're probably necrotic and being uh, dissolved. And this is a toluid and blue section, again, of a piece of heart, inflammatory cells here, down here, an admixture of cells. And within the myocyte fibers, you can see these long filamentous organisms. By the way, these organisms can also be in smooth muscle. They can invade any kind of cell, apparently. And I think in a gerbil, they go to the brain, and I believe they can be demonstrated in the brain tissue, too, as I remember. But for most animals, you think of the triad. For the gerbil, you add the fourth on there. Ileocecal area, liver, and heart. A Campylobacter species, there's a lot that we can said about this. Uh, should probably, you know, there's this intracellular Campylobacter-like organism, which is what they now say causes the atypical hyperplasia. but there are other Campylobacters that have been isolated, whether or not they can cause disease. 
uh, without the iliac hyperplasia, I don't know. And I'm not really going to get into that because you could spend a lot of time talking about Campylobacter's in the hamster. What I'm going to show you is the classic wet tail or the classic, what we can all call atypical ileal hyperplasia, which is regional enteritis, uh, regional hyper, ileal hyperplasia. There are a whole host of names. It was called a, a carcinoma at one time, adenocarcinoma. Uh, lots of different etiologies were thought to be uh, causing this, uh, anywhere from, like I said, a, a neoplasm, cause of that unknown, to viral, to bacterial, different kinds of bacteria too, E. coli, proteus, a whole host of them were implicated at one time. But, what we have here with this condition, atypical ileal hyperplasia, is just that. There is hyperplasia of the distal ileum, followed by lots of inflammatory processes and eventual death. And it classically occurs in weaning animals at the time they're shipped or stressed some other way. You bring them into the facility, they break. If they don't break then, you surgically manipulate them or you do some other experiment with them. Stress precipitates this problem. And you'll find hamsters that look like this not very happy creatures, probably in a lot of pain, but they're aid they just have a lot of problems. They don't eat, they lose weight, don't drink, dehydrate, uh, they hunch up, disheveled fur. I think the hunching, people think that they probably are in tremendous abdominal pain. When you see the lesions, you can appreciate what kind of pain they must be in. They're not very happy campers anyway, but when they have this process, they're really uh, 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 difficult to work with. But they're so sick as well, but they're, they're inactive because of that. They're so sick. Here's one that's really hunched up, long fur, but he's probably in a lot of pain. And again, the classic presentation is this uh, liquid feces around the perianal area, so-called wet tail, but I already showed you the bacillus piliformis can do that. And here's what is seen with atypical ileal hyperplasia. The stomach is here, small intestine comes down, and at this point, the distal ileum is thickened at least two or three times normal at this point. And you see the white spots there? That should tell you something. White spots probably represents necrosis and inflammation. That's what you should always think of with white spots, necrosis and inflammation. I mean, neoplasms can be that way, fibrin, there are lots of things that are white. Most pathological processes in animals are pale or white. But think of that first, because that's one of the most common things that occurs. Then here's the cecum, and here's the large intestine right here, the colon. If you open up that distal ileum, you see these plaques. These plaques are hyperplastic villi. They've grown longer than they should be, in and not just individual ones, in groups. So each plaque represents a bunch of villi that are much longer than they should be. They're elevated as we view them here. They're white because they've undergone necrosis and probably have some inflammatory cells in them. When it's white, think of necrosis and inflammation. So the white things we saw uh, in the other picture through the cirrhosis surface are these white things that we're now viewing on the luminal side. This occurs early on in the infection, within 10 days, I believe. If you, they've done experimental work where they, they haven't isolated the individual organism, but they took a suspension and ground it up and re-inoculated animals. And so the causative agent for the natural condition was put into experimental animals. And the first thing that we saw was this hyperplasia. And that was a very important finding because people didn't understand what came first, the inflammation and the hyper, then the hyperplasia or vice versa, or did it come on simultaneously? Well, I think for the most part, it's accepted that the hyperplasia comes first. Then there's a breakdown and you get the inflammatory process. Now, other bacteria don't have the hyperplastic response as a rule. And so they can be concomitant infections or you could have E. coli and atypical hyperplasia, and I think that's been reported recently, too, where you have two pathogens that are doing different things at the same time. Here are four other examples right here. This is a normal ileum, normal distal ileum, normal uh, cecum. This one here is marked <coughs> thickening. See how it is normal thickness like this one, but all of a sudden it's three or four times X. Here's another one that's marked, but also now we see these white spots. Those white spots re represent inflammation and necrosis and inflammatory cell response, but also note that this thing is adhered. If it's adhered, then you better think, well, something's ruptured through, because these two structures wouldn't adhere if the cirrhosis surface is intact and patent there. What's happened here is the cirrhosis surface has been bridged, and once it gets bridged, fibrinol separative inflammation, and fibrin forms adhesions, and adhesions start healing with fibrous connective tissue, so these things are attached. And the, the, the tougher their attachment is, the more chronic the more fibrosis there is in there. Because first it's 100% fibrin, and when it's completely adhered, and uh, like six months later, it's 100% fibrous connective tissue. 
And here's another one with mild thickening at this point. So we have three different levels of involvement here compared to the normal. Marked, marked with adhesions, and mild. And this is an animal that has a severe presentation of the problem. Look at this piece of bowel here. I'm not, I think this is a cecum here. I can't read. It looks like there's a blind end here, but tremendously enlarged, very, very reddened. It looks like it's ready to rupture. Very glistening congestion and hemorrhage in there. Here it's difficult to discern what the structures are. Testicle here, testicle here. It looks like an adhesion here, although it doesn't have to be. This is a fat, could be epididymis here. But look at this mass. This is abnormal. Very, very severe uh, peritonitis here with adhesions between different organs. What's happened? The thing ruptured through the bowel and created a peritonitis. And this is what it looks like microscopically. This is the ileum here, the villi are pretty typical. They're oftentimes far apart in many rodents. They don't look like they do in the duodenum. So normal height, and all of a sudden, they're increased in thickness. Three or four X, normal. And these over here are necrotic. And so this is definitely necrotic over here. You can't see any basophilia anymore. So what happens is this thing gets long, and then it undergoes necrosis. And with necrosis, you get inflammation. Now, we don't see much going on down here, but I'll show you. Oftentimes, these crypts grow downward, too. And uh, before I get to that, here's another example. This is the most severe I've ever seen. Small intestine uh, ileum here is relatively normal at this point. It is thickened, though. It shouldn't be this tall. But this is normal endothelium here. And look at over here. This is transmural necrosis. There's nothing viable all the way around there. You wonder how this animal survived this long. I mean, it's only got about 30% of the viable lumen or wall it left at this point. The rest of it is completely necrotic. Eosinophilic debris. Tremendous hyperplasia with necrosis. Closer uh, view of that, showing again these villi that are thickened, not as bad as it could be, but all this necrotic material here. And a higher magnification, complete necrosis. Now, this is what happens in other animals. The hyperplastic villi are here. This is the muscularis mucosa at this point. And this is a crypt. And this crypt should not be this deep. This crypt should be above the muscularis mucosa, but this one's growing down. And what you also see is that the epithelial cells are disrupted. Some of these are flattened. Here they're gone. Here they're flat. These are not normal at this point. The bacteria invade the epithelial cells. They are in the apical cytoplasm. These intracellular campylobacter-like organisms, these curved bacilli, they're in the cytoplasm. That's what I'm talking about, which was thought to be campylobacter and maybe still is. But anyway, this crypt is, first of all, it's taking a turn to go the opposite direction, so it's, it's pushed cells up this way to make long villi. Now it's pushing cells down this way. And these cells are dying because they're infected, and dead cells induce inflammation, and inflammation kills cells too, so all of a sudden we got an influx of inflammatory cells here. These look like they're primarily neutrophils to me, but I think there are some macrophages in there. I think this is a little pocket of neutrophils. This could be a crypt here with, with no epithelium left, but there's tremendous inflammation here. And here's an example where these crypts have gone up, push cells up, but also they're pushing cells down. And now we're in a pyrus patch. And in this pyrus patch, it is farther, it's deeper than it should be. They shouldn't be dangling out here like they are. Here's a serosal surface, and here's a serosal surface. This pyrus patch is much lower than it should be. Now, a couple points here. Is Crypts will often grow down into pyrus patches. That's not an abnormality, in my opinion, when they're in the submucosa up here. But in this case, the, the pyrus patch is much deeper than it should be. It's hanging out here in the abdominal cavity, basically, surrounded by serosa. But the crypts have also gone down here. So these are cross sections of villi, I guess you could call them at this point. We have solid structures surrounded by space. And so basically, they're forming villi in an inverse way down in, the, in a pocket. Uh, a pouch that's, that's inverted this way. This is not a diverticulum, by the way. We talk about diverticula and pseudodiverticula. A diverticulum is where everything goes and all layers are present. So if you take your fist and you punch it into the stomach of something and all layers are there, it's a diverticulum. But if you punch it through and three, three out of four layers break, or one out, of, one out of four, or two out of four, or three out of four, when you have a break in the number of layers, then it's called a pseudodiverticulum at that point. But anyway, this is what happens. And you can see we're one step away from this thing rupturing and dumping ingest into the abdominal cavity and create a tremendous fibrinoseparative peritonitis. Now, this is an animal that survived. And some of them do. They are sick. Most of them will die. 
but some of them will survive and they'll die later on, like this animal did. And this piece of ilium, here's the lumen, mucosis here, that consists of the villi, crypts, and the lamina propria. Muscularis mucosa is not present. Here's muscle here. Submucosa is not present. Here's the muscularis externa. And here is where it should have ended, but you can see there are crypts in here. And this is all fibrous connective tissue. This is massage, which demonstrates collagen, meant to demonstrate fibrous connective tissue proliferation. So this animal survived it and has many crypts outside of the muscularis externa, underneath a very thick and serosal surface. And that is a very extreme presentation of uh, what can happen uh, if an animal doesn't uh, die immediately, but you've got this downgrowth of cribs. And this is an electron micrograph of a, the apical portion of an enterocyte. Here are microvilli up here, the surface here, the lumen's up here, microvilli right in here, and here's B is bacillus, uh, tangential or longitudinal section right here, here. I'm not sure what that end is supposed to demonstrate there, but there are cross, there are profiles here of these bacteria in the apical cytoplasm. Now, 50 or 60 of them can be in there at one time. That is the so-called atypical ileal hyperplasia, thought to be caused by a Campylobacter organism. And now I think people are kind of wondering. Uh, I may have a slide or two out of order here. Now they're talking about um, chlamydia being involved in this. Uh, the strain SPFD, uh, they're talking about disulfyl vibrio organisms, so all of a sudden there's a little bit of discontent about what's the etiology of that. But also there are other Campylobacters that have been isolated from the bowels, and uh, you know, there's Campylobacter jejuni, Campylobacter pylori, and they may or may not be related at all to this condition. Campylobacter, or uh, Clostridium difficile, as I said, this I think the first reports came out, there was a report in 1982 where because the animals had received antibiotics, they were, they were not sure that this was a, uh, a natural case of Clostridium difficile infection. To backtrack a little bit, in people, many people will develop pseudomembranous colitis caused by Clostridium difficile. They usually get it because they have been treated with antibiotics. So antibiotic treatment to a person Many people will develop pseudomembranous colitis, PMC. It's in the colon and there's a pseudomembrane there, which is fibrin and cellular debris that's leaked through and covered the mucosal surface. But not all of the people had antibiotics. So they then discovered that this thing occurs in animals as well, and particularly the hamster. So the hamster was a good model of this disease in people, pseudomembranous colitis. So if you treated a hamster with a variety of, any kind of a variety of, back, of antibiotics, they would develop the same problem. The thing about it was is that instead of developing in the colon though, usually they develop more of it in the cecum. And second of all, we didn't get as much of the pseudomembrane as that was typically seen in people. So there were two differences between the human natural condition or a atypical condition, if you think they got antibiotics anyway, and the animal model, the hamster. In 1982, there was a report came out where they had seen this same condition in a hamster, but they had used antibiotics months earlier in the room, I guess, or maybe in some of the same, uh, some of the cages on the same rack or whatever. So they were a little uncertain. Well, uh, I think in the late 80s, uh, Walter Reed had a few animals where they did not receive antibiotics, had been stressed, and there was a report out of NMIT where they had some animals as well that never received antibiotics. And now all of a sudden it seems like there are more and more cases come up where the animals are getting the same condition without the use of antibiotics. Probably associated with stress, but sometimes that's difficult to establish. Sometimes very obvious, you know, he had a heat problem or water deprivation problem or move the animals around or whatever. And other times you say, gee, I don't know, we just had a different caretaker go in there three weeks ago, did that stress him or not? Well, who knows? But anyway, I want to show you some slides uh, of a natural outbreak well, this is only two or three animals with this particular slides here, but we had 40 of them at another facility. The thing that is important is that this is cecum. And one of the critical factors here is that there is hyperplasia of this epithelium. This epithelium is probably three or four times thicker than it's supposed to be. And that'll tie in with another entity here in a little bit. That's one of the things you see is the cecum is much, much thicker than it's supposed to be. 
And this is Clostridium difficile, natural infection now. And also we see that the epithelial cells at the tips up here are piled up. You get tufting, tufting, like a tuft of hair. These are, these are the extrusion points in the bowel. You know, the epithelial cells, they divide down here in the crypts and they get pushed up the villus, they mature, they do their thing, and they get up to the tip and they're sloughed. Well, here they're hanging on and they're vacuolated. So we've got thickening of the mucosa, tufting of the epithelial cells up here, but also notice that beneath the muscularis mucosa down here, there are collections of inflammatory cells. Most of these appear to be neutrophils and there's some edema here. The clear fluid is edema. Looks a little hypercellular in here too. Closer magnification shows again this tuft. See, here's a, a villar, or not a villar, but a, a, a mucosal area here, and all of a sudden there's a whole collection of cells that are stuck together. They should be gone by this point. Same thing here. Almost looks like a syscytial of cells here. But we got vacuolation of these cells. There's debris in the lumen, which may or may not mean anything. There are increased numbers of cells here, but a few increased numbers of cells doesn't really mean anything. Uh, I guess if they're localized, I would put more credence on it being significant, but if it's diffuse, doesn't mean much. If they're not neutrophils or very foamy macrophage, in other words, if they're plasma cells and lymphocytes alone, I don't get too excited about it. But this is definitely abnormal up here. And again, showing these enlarged, vacuolated cells, tufting. And here's an area you'd say, gee, this is at least congestion. This looks like a vessel. This looks like a vessel, maybe some hemorrhage. This is probably hemorrhage here because they're scattered about. They're not in a capillary at this point. The same thing here, a few neutrophils present. Another area, now we're getting to some other areas here. This looks like fibrin here with enmeshed neutrophils. All these little small nuclei represent uh, neutrophil nuclei. So we're getting fibrin and, and uh, neutrophil exudation. Another area, kind of a pseudomembrane forming here. There's, this is probably some fibrin here, congestion. Typical, another area here where there's tufting of cells. Uh, some fibrin here. I guess I'm really emphasizing this, this thing. Hi hyperplasia tufting of cells, thrombosis. Here's the fibrin here, pieces of nuclei right in here. And then here's an area where there's considerable hemorrhage. There's no question there's hemorrhage here. And there's sloughing of cells up at this point. So this is Clostridium difficile. In this particular case, they isolated, they detected the cytotoxin B component. There's two toxins, uh, toxin A and toxin B. Uh, and the toxin B, I guess, is the easiest one to assay for. Anyway, that's Clostridium difficile. There's hyperplasia here, and at the end, I'm going to talk to you about cecal mucosal hyperplasia, which was reported, oh, six or seven years ago, where it didn't seem like they had the same changes, the inflammation and fibrin and all that, but they had mucosal hyperplasia. And there's another report came out recently, too, where there's cecal mucosal hyperplasia, but neither one of those I'm talking about was their associated Clostridium infection. I always think of Clostridium as being an acute process that induces a lot of edema and congestion and maybe some hemorrhage. Now E. coli can probably do a lot of this too. You think about E. coli, there are four kinds of E. coli, you know, some invade, some cause diarrhea by altering the uh, cyclic A and P thing and they got secretory diarrheas. Well, some other diarrheas will actually induce hemorrhage, some diarrheas will invade. So it's a matter of which ones you're dealing with with E. coli. So E. coli, I think in my mind, is a definite pathogen and it's been different uh, strains have been isolated at times, and, but they haven't been, they've always tried to tie them in with this ileal hyperplasia. So I think E. coli is a pathogen, I think Clostridium difficile is a pathogen, and that can cause hyperplasia of the bowel, particularly the cecum. Campylobacter likes can cause uh, hyperplasia with inflammation, and there are probably other Campylobacters that can cause inflammation without hyperplasia. So you all of a sudden, and Bacillus piliformis is thrown in there. So to sort these out is very, very difficult. But you must keep those in mind and think about hyperplasias as being a component of at least two of those entities, atypical hyperplasia and the Clostridium difficile. And so this is a E. coli, chlamydia species, a strain SP, SFPD. This is, again, implicated, a report or two of this out associated with atypical ileal hyperplasia. The sulfovibrio, again, there's a report or two of this as being the cause of atypical ileal hyperplasia. Those are not listed in your handout if you're looking for them. So if you assume that you probably have seen those, I don't have, basically the slides are the first ones I showed you uh, of the wet tail condition or the atypical hyperplasia. Are there questions about that before we move on? Because that's very important and I hope I made that clear enough 
about those entities, how you can hopefully try to differentiate them when you look at them microscopically, because it makes a big difference for what you do in follow-up. Remember to keep sequel content. Sequel content is a very important thing. Don't ever try and diagnose clostridium, enteric clostridia diseases by culture. That is a worthless effort, simply because clostridium are oftentimes present. And if you culture them, it means nothing. If you see do direct smears and, you, and the animal is fresh, it means a lot. If you see overwhelming numbers of clostridium in a fresh smear, then it means you've got a lot of clostridium, but it still doesn't mean you're producing toxin. You've got to have the contents to prove that there was a toxin present at the time the animal died. And even if you find a toxin in an animal has been dead for a day, it doesn't mean anything either. You've got to get a fresh carcass, fresh sequel contents or contents of the bowel, and get the toxin out of that. That's the only way you're going to make a definitive diagnosis. Moving on to viral infections. With lesions, hamster cytomegalovirus, I'll show you that. Lymphocytic choriomeningitis, I already showed you that. Uh, again, it's no different. The classic thing is no different than what I showed you in the guinea pig. What is that? Lymphocytes where? In the choroid plexus and in the meninges, but also elsewhere in the body, but very nonspecific. In addition to that, in the hamster, depending on when you inoculate them, you can get a variety of things, including vasculitis and glomerular changes in a very complex area, depending on the strain of the virus you use and the age of the hamster you use. So it's a, it's a lecture in its own right to talk about LCM in hamsters or any species. Pneumonia virus of mice, I don't think this is very well documented. There are reports going back to 1940 where this virus was shown to produce uh, inflammation of the turbinates and probably the lungs, much like, like you'd see it, at least in lungs in mice. And then Sendai virus as well. Now, I've got glass slides that are labeled Sendai virus that are training slides. Now, I don't know how they determine that. If they looked at the lesion and said it looks like Sendai virus as we see it in mice, or they did an isolate. And as far as I'm concerned, unless you have an isolate, I really don't, I'm not going to be convinced that it's Sendai virus. I really am not. Uh, you have to, and that's a difficult thing, is you have to have viral isolation or serology from survivors or something to prove it. Just because it looks like Sendai, I'm not going to say it is. But I think that there is a good suggestion that all four of those viruses can cause a lesion. Hamster cytomegalovirus, what's different about this one is the fact that it is not in the ductal epithelial cells, but in the aster cells. Now here is a salivary gland from a hamster, here's a duct. See anything wrong with those cells? No, they look okay, but look over here. Here's an aster structure right here, at least I think it is. Large nucleus, eosinophilic inclusion, eosinophilic inclusion. Large nucleus here, the halo, and then the eosinophilic inclusion. So in the hamster, it affects the aster epithelial cells as opposed to the ductor epithelial cells. Now here are other viral infections that have been reported. Uh, without lesions, and I, I put without lesions here, uh, which means I'm not including the inclusion itself. And I'll show you this. This is, came out of uh, University of Missouri where they uh, discovered uh, intranuclear inclusion bodies in the intestinal, small intestine of some hamsters that were relatively young. And uh, it turns out that this virus uh, it produces inclusions at a very restricted time frame. It's like 16 to 23 or 26 days after birth is when you see these inclusions. But after that, you can find antibody, but the inclusions are gone. And I, after they discovered this, they went and they surveyed, I think, six or eight other uh, groups of animals, and they did them at the right age and demonstrated it in all of them. So apparently, this virus is very prevalent. It's related to the, uh, is it K7 strain and not the FL strain? I think that's the antibody they used to detect it. Now, hamster papilla virus, I had this without lesions, and I'm going to show you that maybe not so. I put in here this uh, cutaneous lymphosarcoma thing, which has been off and on in the literature for a number of years, and I think there's becoming more and more good evidence that there is a papilla virus in hamsters that can be a very devastating condition. And there was a breeder of hamsters who had reports of this condition in very young animals up to uh, as long as three months of age, and I think out of 15,000 they found maybe a dozen or eight that had cutaneous lymphosarcoma. And uh, they decided not to depopulate that, but it's raised concern that this virus is out there and it can cause severe disease and death in very young animals. So I'm going to show you some material on this papilla virus. I understand also this was on the lab animal boards here a year or two ago. Another good reason to show it. Uh, these other, excuse me, these other uh, viruses are, are present uh, serologically in hamsters. Let me show you these two uh, 
top conditions here. This is an example of these inclusions that can be seen. Now these are, look at this nucleus here and look at this nucleus here. Well, is that big? Well, it's, it's misshapen, and it's round. Say, well, maybe, it's, why isn't it cytomegalovirus? Well, good point. I mean, you can't always be sure. And I'd say, well, I, I wouldn't be convinced. I'd say, well, I guess it's adenovirus. It's not big enough to be cytomegalovirus, but I can't be sure about that. But this is what you see. There are no other associated changes with the uh, hamster adenovirus. Higher magnification of those. Again. And they did electron microscopy and the size range is correct and all that. Now these are some slides that uh, I got from uh, a colleague in Chicago uh, where we had uh, a hamster and she uh, suspected this condition uh, when she saw this hamster. I think this animal is about three months of age. And look at, the, look at the lesions here. What we have are crusty areas here. Look like ulceration with cellular crust. But if you look carefully, it looks like there's elevations there too and I think I can demonstrate that to, to you. There's the uh, other side, the other side of the animal now. It's rolled over. We see different crusts. There's the back leg here. I don't know if you can see lumps or bumps. I want you to see lumps and bumps in the skin. This is the dorsum of the animal here. Again, these alopecic areas, and many of which have these elevations with serum crust. These are ulcers. What we have here are nodules in the skin that have ulcerated. This is the ventrum of the animal, multiple lesions. And here, we're on the face again, showing an ulcerated area here. See the bumps? There's a nodule here, nodule here, all over the place. Not as it only alopecia, but it's also masses growing. And I think this is the best one's right here. You can see a mass here with multiple contiguous ulcerations present, ulceration here as well. And here's the histopath. This is the skin, skin surface here. This is an ulcer right in this area. It's filled by this, covered by the serocellular crust and a tremendous sheet of cells that's thickened the dermis. Down here is a subcuticular muscle here, and maybe some or neoplastic cells down here as well. And microscopically, there is no involvement of the basal area because you have to think about mycosis fungoides, which has been reported in hamsters. I wouldn't expect mycosis fungoides to be this severe, but that's another uh, neoplasm of lymphocytes you have to consider. But here are the cells, a sheet of cells here. And very high magnification. Now, what impressed me about these is how bizarre shaped these things are. Look at the size range. Here's a nucleus of one, a nucleus of a neighbor right here. Variation is very, is very dramatic between these cells, abnormal. And you know, I'd say, well, how do you know that's lymphosarcoma? Well, I guess I don't. You know, how do I know this is even Popova virus related? I guess I don't. I just want to point this out that I think this probably is. And there is this entity out there, and you should all be aware of it. So if you have hamsters like this, then you should be thinking along these lines, because this would be a very important uh, thing to find. And it, it gets into the etiology and the interaction of DNA and the virus and all this stuff, which I'm not going to get into. And here's the liver, portal area, portal area, central vein. Portal area is effective. And that's typical for lymphosarcoma in many animal species, that most of the infiltrates in the liver are going to be in the portal and periportal areas. And here, Notice how homogeneous looking these cells are. This is not inflammation. This is definitely, in my mind, this is lymphosarcoma. I'm now, no questions about this. This is lymphosarcoma now. Is this the same process that's going on in the skin? I don't know. I think it is. Mitotic figure here. And this is a very striking change. This is the non glandular part of the stomach. So this is the epithelium of the stomach right in here. This thick. This is the muscularis externa. And look at the submucosa. The submucosa is filled with these hypercellular uh, masses. Well, I shouldn't call them masses, it's a continuous layer of hypercellularity. And the closer magnification shows, again, these cells look like they did in the liver. I thought I had another one in there. Anyway, I think that the parenchymal organs have got lymphosarcoma in them. I'm convinced of that. And the fact that this animal is so young, and the fact that this came from the vendor that had this problem, I really believe in my heart that this is the Popova virus induced lymphosarcoma, cutaneous lymphosarcoma. Now another thing about it is this virus has been found in association with uh, cutaneous uh, epitheliosis, they call it. Uh, with, there are many, many crater-form lesions filled with keratin. It's called epitheliosis. And in that particular entity, the virus is found, as I recall. In this particular entity, they can only find DNA, but not the intact virus. So there's a lot of the biology of this that I 
don't understand or don't know, but there's a considerable amount of interest in what's going on with this particular virus or parts of viruses and the two agents that the two disease processes it's causing. So I threw that in there just to cover, make sure you're aware of it. Uh, it's not in your handout at all. So you'll have to dig out, there's some stuff, articles in lab animal science on it. Mycotic infections, very, very rare in hamsters. I have one in a bottle. Uh, a friend of mine gave it to me. I never looked at it. He says it's a typical uh, deep fungus infection. I believe him. And why they don't occur more often, I don't know. But very few people have seen mycotic infections in hamsters. Enteric flagellates, a long list of them here. Most of these are in the small intestine. Most of these are not very important. I'll show you some of these just so you can be familiar with the morphology of them. Hexamida mirus, now called spiral nucleus mirus, is an important pathogen of mice. It's thought that it causes disease in mice. Giardia mirus uh, is not a pathogen. This one is a, a human entity, which probably is not pathogenic as well. Generally, they're not important. Spiral nucleus mirus is seen in the small intestine. Books will tell you the anterior small intestine, but I'll show you that I found this in the cecum, just doing a regular smear. And uh, then I found a reference that said they are there. Uh, in hamsters, by the way, it's, these have been found in blood films. They had, took a blood smear of an animal that had atypical ileal hyperplasia. And it's thought that the organism penetrated in through the lesion, got in the bloodstream, became systemic, and was found then on a blood film. This is a schematic of what it looks like. It's got two nuclei, two to three microns wide, and seven to nine microns long. It's got three pairs of anterior flagella, two posterior. And I did a little work this summer just to see what these things look like in a a smear. Now this is a very high magnification. These are bacteria. Here's a bacterium, bacterium, bacterium right here. This is from the cecum of normal hamsters. And I did about five, I think twice. Five animals each time. They were on experiment, but they were clinically normal. And they had a, a lung mass implanted with chemotherapy. So the intestinal tract looked normal. There was no evidence of diarrhea in these animals. But here's an organism right here. You can see the two nuclei. It looks like they're looking up at us. Here's another one down here. These two are out of focus. These two are now in focus, I think. These are out of focus, but these are what they look like on a, this is actually fixed now. They're not, a, it's not a wet mound, it's a prep. I guess a fecal prep or ingestal prep. Here's what they look like on histopath. Very high magnification. These are epithelial cells that are lining the villi. These are intervillar spaces in the anterior small intestine. And here are the organisms. Very small, delicate, a tangled mass of them here. This is hexamida mirus, what it looks like, or spironucleus mirus. And again, it's commonly seen in hamsters, but it is not considered a pathogen in hamsters. Just to show you the morphology, and you can recognize these things. Giardia mirus, uh, again, it's a normal commensal in hamsters. Looks like Giardia lambia. And Giardia this is an important disease in many other animals. Cats and dogs get this, people get it. So you should be aware. This is a schematic of it, again, three microns here. You can see what it looks like. Pear shape with two nuclei and the trophozoite. Hexamida has a cyst stage, by the way. So does this thing here. Here's what one of my uh, what organs look like. Again, these are bacteria here, so you can imagine I'm a very high magnification, showing one of these trophozoites with the two eyes, looking at you. And here's a schematic where it looks like it's looking down over here, a little bit dis uh, disgruntled, and I found one that looks just like that too. So I thought I'd show that one. <laughs> the schematics are very accurate. And here's what they look like in histopathological sections. Again, we're in the anterior small intestine, villus here, and in the intervillar spaces, there's a pure population here of these curvilinear structures. And these are what they look like. And what's nice is sometimes you can find them feeding on the brush border. They have what they call a sucker, is what they're, they call it in the, in the protozoology books, uh, which uh, an attachment device, I'm sure, and I'm not sure if the sucker's here or the sucker's here, but looks like it's crawling along feeding on the brush border. But these are, this is fairly characteristic for Giardia, so I think I can differentiate hexamina from Giardia. And then the sarcodines, Entamoeba mirus, again, is a common organism found in the cecum and large intestine. Here's schematics showing the trophozoite form and a mature cyst, five microns. These things vary in size. When I say mature, as I think I've found cysts that have only one nucleus, and I showed it to somebody else and they agreed, here's what it looks like on a 
prepared uh, ingestible smear. Again, this is stained with Masans, by the way. All these things over here are trichomonads. And basically, the cecum of a normal hand smear appears to me to be 95% trichomonads and 5% ingesta, and then a few other things thrown in there. But this is a trophozoite of a, I think it's a trophozoite of entamoeba. Although I'm not so sure now, the person told me that this is too round, and usually they're, they're not perfectly spherical like this thing. So she thought that this could be an early cyst form with one nucleus. But the cyst wall is not very prominent. And here it's supposed to show another one here, I think, where the cyst wall is more prominent. Yes, doesn't it look a little more hyalinized there? She thought this was an early cyst with one nucleus, but it should get eight when it's mature. And here's what it looks like on histopath. This came, this is from an animal that had enteritis. And uh, nothing was found except lots of blood in the large intestine, which we see here. I'll show it to you. Here are the entamoeba forms here. And a higher magnification, entamoeba, 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 no, trichomonad, trichomonad. All of a sudden, there are trichomonads in here, and they're red blood cells. At the time, this is 10 years ago or so, nothing was found to explain the diarrhea. There's blood in the GI tract, and thought maybe these are pathogenic sarcodines, entamoeba mirus, causing pathology. And there are tons of trichomonads. We thought, well, they're not important. Now I think that this is probably Clostridium or E. coli or something like this, and this is all incidental. And the reason I think that is because we, this outbreak we had where we had 40 or more animals that died that we know is Clostridium difficile. If you look at the, the, any part of the GI tract, it's loaded with microorganisms. These things proliferate in a diarrheic condition. They just multiply tremendously. So I think that all of this is secondary to some other pathogen that we completely missed. And here it is again, showing these multiple. You have to kind of be careful here. What is an entamoeba, and what is a, what is a trichomonad? And I think these are trichomonads, these par piriform ones here, where the round ones or oblong ones are, are the sarcodines. And here is what the fecal smear looks like from, excuse me, the fecal smear from a normal hamster. Basically, all of these things here are trichomonads. Here's some ingester right here. And here's what they look like at higher magnification. You can see the kind of they got the little bumps on them. And that's where the uh, undulating membrane is attached. And uh, the best thing I had was uh, you can see them here very nicely. And this is a trichomonad here. And there, there are different kinds of trichomonads. So I just went through that. I found it interesting that these things are very commonly seen. Hamster's a gold mine for protozoal uh, agents. Again, Toxoplasma gondii. This is a mistake here. It's encephalozoan caniculi. There has never been a natural report, a report of a natural infection with these things in hamsters, by the way. I hear somebody say there was, but I don't think, if you, if you know of a natural case of this, I'd appreciate knowing it because not one been reported. Experimentally, though, these animals are just as susceptible to experimental infection as any other animal. And the question, why is that so? Why is it that hamster doesn't have natural cases of it when the organisms are so prevalent in the environment or in our animal colonies? Good question. Again, toxo can be readily seen on H&E, encephalozoan cannot. Gram positive, this is wall PS positive here. Valentinium coli, now the guinea pig was Valentinium cavii. Coli is a different organism. Morphologically, it appears differently. And this is the same one that occurs in pigs and in people where it can be pathogenic. And this is what it looks in a schematic. I didn't show you that earlier, but this is the kidney-shaped nucleus right here. And there's a difference in the number of vacuoles, and the rows of cilia are different. There are kind, all kinds of morphologic changes, differences. And here's a cecum of a hamster showing multiple Ballantidium coli organisms, kidney-shaped nucleus here, a macronucleus and a micronucleus. The micronucleus is not present in any of these, I don't believe. And here's a PAS stain section again showing these organisms. They're not as easy seen here, I don't think. Helminth parasites, cestodes. Uh, Cystocircus fascularis, a couple reports of this, or one report in literature, but I think there's another case of it that was circulated in the C.L. Davis slides uh, where they had a mo an outbreak of this in hamsters. Uh, these are, this is a cyst form of uh, tinea, tinea formis in cats and dogs. Hymenalpus diminuata. 
Hymenalpus microstoma, Hymenalpus nana. Uh, this is a very important parasite, tapeworm, the only known tapeworm that does not require an intermediate host, and because of that, it is a very dangerous organism, not only for your animals, but for your caretakers and anybody who handles these animals. And I'll tell you why. Getting back to uh, uh, Fasciolaris, Cystocircus Fasciolaris, this is a hamster liver, and I apologize, I didn't want it to be this high. I wanted a subgross and a that miscommunication. This is hamster liver here, and this thing is about three to four millimeters across the top if you looked at the, the section on the glass slide, and as if you look at the liver, you'd find it that way too. And it can be clear or it can be white. And within that is a wall that's contiguous with the liver, and it extends out, and here are cross and tangential sections of the cystocircus itself, which is unique in its own right in that it's not a cystocircus as we know it, with an invaginated scolex, it's got an extended scolex, and because of that it's called a strobal circus. And I think that that's one of the few parasites, if not the only one, that is called a strobal circus because it has this extended scolex with a very long neck. And this thing is coiled up. And a couple features is how do you know that's a tapeworm? Well, there are a couple things. Number one, and this is very basic parasitology, and if you don't know this, I'd recommend that you learn it because it really saves you a lot of time if you can differentiate nematodes from trematodes from cestodes and arthropods. Uh, based on a few factors on a microscopic basis. Number one, there's apparently no GI tract, which puts it in the cestode category already, and there's going to be calcareous corpuscles, which I'll show you. Uh, if there is a GI tract, but it's solid like this, then you've got to think of trematodes, and nematodes are different yet. But anyway, this wall here is what we think is the origin of the sarcomas that are produced. This is one of the few parasites that is capable of inducing sarcomas and fibrosarcomas are what's most commonly reported in the livers of animals that have this parasite intermediate stage. And mice and rats, a lot of animals can get it. And it's thought to arise from this capsule here. And this is the parenchyma again of the parasite and a higher magnification shows the cuticle here and here are these calcareous corpuscles which are characteristic of cestodes only. So it's nice to know that. So here you've got a liver from a hamster, a cestode parasite in there, uh, and it's got, we know it's cesto because of this, and say, well, what is it? Most likely it's Cystocircus fasciolaris. Now getting on to the other cestodes, Hymenolopus nana is the small, a very small tapeworm. It's like one millimeter wide, uh, variable length, obviously, depending on how many uh, proglottids it's got. It is the only known cesto that can go directly uh, from host to host without having an intermediate host. And it, but it can go to the intermediate if it wants to flower beetles, uh, moths, or other things that can serve as intermediate hosts here. And here are some parasites in the small intestine of a hamster. We see some proglottids here, proglottids here, here, and here's the head, the rostellum is down here, or the scolex is down here with the rostellum on it. Here's another one here. They embed uh, into the intervillar spaces. Higher magnification showing you in the number of proglottids here, and here is the head with the scolus, the suckers. And here again, you can see a sucker here, a sucker here, the neck of the parasite. Not much damage here. Doesn't invade here very deeply. This one may be just starting, or I'm not sure what, maybe it's function of cut, but there's not much going on around here. And here are some of the uh, proglottids. The proglottids are wider than they are longer. Basically, this is a proglottid here, there's one here, one here, one here, they're, they're very, very narrow. You can see these with the naked eye, but you have to look for them if they're few. Now here is a villus, and it's got a structure in the lamina propria of this. And this is where you get into the life cycle. The parasite has an egg, and the egg is embryonated, it has an oncosphere in it. That hatches in the small intestine when the animal ingests it. It will develop into, if it, let me back up. If the animal eats the intermediate host, the intermediate host consists, con, contains a sister circoid larvae which exists and develops into an adult mature tapeworm. So there's never any invasion of the host intestine. It's only in the lumen. So if the hamster eats an intermediate host that has the infection in its body, it will get a tapeworm in its lumen 
and a little tapeworm will grow, produce eggs, and whatever. And there's very little tissue immunity because the parasite never invaded the host small intestine. If the hamster does not get the infection from an intermediate host, but eats the egg itself, then the oncosphere hatches out of the egg, but it hasn't completed a stage of its life cycle, and in that case, it invades the hamster and bowel, and that's what's happened here. Here we have a cystocircoid larvae that has actually invaded a lamina propria, the lamina propria of a villus. <coughs> this is going to induce one heck of an immune response, and that's very important for what happens later on. So all of a sudden, we now have Evidence here, this is evidence right here that this hamster ate a, an egg from this parasite and not the intermediate host of the parasite. Here it is at a different angle, and you can see part of a sucker here. There's the rostellum is right in here. There are hooklets in there that differentiate from other hymenolipids, by the way. So you can tell those structures. If you put polarized light on here, you'd see uh, some other elements that are refractal, like this one here. This is beautiful. A lamina propria here, showing this larval stage here. Here's the rostellum with hooks, and the sucker here, a sucker here, a sucker here, a sucker here. And here it is under polarized light, showing the, how birefringent and beautiful, uh, showing the rostellum with its hooklets. This is now going to uh, come out of the lamina propria, out of the villus into the lumen, and develop into the adult tapeworm. Now here we are in a lymph node showing again some of these larvae. These things can go deeper than just the wall of the small intestine. They can go into parenchymal organs like the mesenteric lymph nodes as well. Now to follow up that story, if that animal got the infection from an intermediate host that doesn't have tissue immunity, it can get reinfected, get reinfected. And you can see this longer. If it got it the other way, it's going to have tremendous immunity and it won't get reinfected. It'll fight off infection. What's critical here is that these animals will get this infection and will clear the infection normally between, before you and I will ever do an examination on them. You can have this in your facility and never know it because you're looking at animals that are too old to have the infection. So if you don't look at them between three or four weeks of age or younger than that, you're going to miss the presence of this parasite because the animals will shed, get rid of it, and you'll never catch it. It'll be persistent in animals in the colony, but you'll never see it unless you happen to do a post on a younger animal that died for some other reason or was sacrificed. So it's important. It's more prevalent than people realize. And your caretakers can get it too. <coughs> All right, helminth parasites, a uh, whole list of them here. I'll talk about a couple of these. A lot of these have been reported only once or twice. Uh, the ones that I want to show you is Spicularis tetraptera, which may or may not be present in hamsters. I've seen reports that it apparently is, but then I uh, read Dr. Wagner's chapter, and uh, he's wondering if it really is, and I never went back to check papers myself. I guess it really is not for certain that this parasite can parasitize hamsters, but it certainly can in mice, no question about it. So it's Spicularis tetraptera and Cephacia uh, albuleta are the two common pinworms that are seen. Uh, this one's definitely seen in hamsters, uh, but this is also seen in rats and mice. Both This is a mouse tapeworm and this is a mouse tapeworm, but they're also seen in rats as well. And here are these parasites. If you're lucky enough, you can f determine which species is which. If you have a round esophageal bulb, it's ovuleta, Cephacia ovuleta. The other one has an oblong uh, esophageal bulb. If you have Large cervical ailey, it's testroptera. And we know we're cervix because here's the esophagus. So we know anatomically where we are because of the triradiate esophagus here. I imagine Commander, or Commander Colonel Gardner talked about this with you. I think he talked about parasites. Everything I know I learned from Chris. Anyway, I think this is right. And here are small lateral ailey right here, but these are very large cervical ailey. And then the shape of the eggs is very important. Uh, Cephacia. Uh, Avaletta has eggs with a flat surface on one side. They're uh, not perfectly ellipsoidal. So if you happen to get this, you can make a species, I shouldn't say species, you can make a genera identification on histopathology. And these are, some, these are commonly seen. Histopathology is fairly accurate in picking up pinworm infections. And this is the parasite from the other pinworm here with an oval or a perfectly ellipsoidal egg. Flies, arthropod parasites, these are occasionally seen uh, Musca domestica larvae have been found in hamsters, and I found this in a hamster 
that I had uh, when I was uh, early in training, Sarcophaga hemorrhoidalis, the red-tailed flesh fly, found on the fourth floor of a research facility. Animal died because it had uh, been inoculated with leishmaniasis, and there was reported uh, ulceration or uh, uh, rectal vaginal fistula uh, in this area. And when I put the animal into a CO2 chamber, I didn't see this when I first saw it. When I put it in the CO2 chamber, pulled it out, all of a sudden I saw these larvae crawling around the anal area. And they are very, very active. And here is the diaphragm, liver lobe, liver lobe, kidney here, bowels. There are three or four of them up here. There were 18 of these larvae in the abdominal cavity of this hamster. And these are the maggots produced by the red-tailed flesh fly that somehow got on the fourth floor of a research facility and it deposited its eggs in that uh, ulcerated area there. And that's the characteristic of it. They are live, larvae viviparous, and they deposit their eggs in fetid sores and wounds. And then we uh, took pictures of them in a Petri dish. These things were very fast. We had to take the picture because they'd crawl out and would crawl away. And then we took eight of them, pupated them in the ground, and they grew out nice pupa. And then they further uh, developed into flies, which enabled them to identify them. This is the head of a pin here. <coughs> and I don't know if this is a male or female, but this is a red-tailed flesh fly. Incidental thing. Other parasites, mites. Uh, and so this is a, always a possibility here. This is the uh, northern fall mite, I think. It, no, this is the more northern fall mite. This is a, a mite that doesn't live on the host but feeds on them. And it can be a problem uh, if you don't have good facilities. I think there's one report of this in South America. These are commonly seen if you look for them. Uh, Demodex oriti is the one that's in the hair follicles or pilosebaceous units. And Demodex creciti is in the epidermis alone. And uh, not where you expect uh, them to find them either. They're in the skin. Uh, Demodex areti, as I said, in the pilosebaceous units, here's the skin surface here. And here's a very long form right here, an adult probably. Here are two more profiles over here. The adults and the eggs are above the pilosebaceous units or the sebaceous gland duct. The nymphs and the larvae are beneath that. And I think they all feed on the sebaceous gland cells and debris. And that's how they survive. Whereas the other one, Demonex chrysiti, is only in the epidermis. And here it is in a very thin skin area. Uh, don't know what form this is, but they're not very big. They're about half the length of a normal one. A normal Demodex is like 180 microns and uh, 30 wide or 20 wide. This one is half the length and twice the width. And they crawl around in the epidermis. And you have to take the skins, and they're not in the rump, dorsal rump area where the epidermis is thicker. They feed in the really thin areas where maybe this is more delicate food, I don't know, or more tasty food, but they feed on keratinocytes, supposedly. But it's a second type of demodex found. And I believe cats are the only other species that got two types of demodex, I believe. Maybe there are others now. But metabolic disease, just a few words about this. Uh, pregnancy toxemia has been reported. And some in hamsters, there was a report uh, a year or two ago, I think in uh, Javma or somewhere, of a natural outbreak. I shouldn't say outbreak, but they had some time pregnancy. Hamsters delivered, and a, several of them died of this. And it pretty much was analogous to that we see in people, except most of the time in people, you know, pregnancy toxemia, you get uh, hypertension and edema, and it's deadly. It can be deadly in, in hamsters, too and in guinea pigs, but uh, the hypertension is generally not recognized at least, and edema is not recognized, but you get proteinuria. We get proteinuria in animals, but we don't recognize the hypertension and we don't see the edema all the time. Now, in this particular uh, instance, uh, at least one in research facility said they saw edema, and I believe it, but the animal also had amyloid, and that bothers me a little bit because amyloid doses can very readily cause ascites and a tremendous fluid accumulation in hamsters. And whenever I see a hamster that's twice its size and roly-poly and full of edema and a sarca, yeah, and a sarca and a peritoneal abdominal or abdominal edema, I always think of amyloidosis as the primary cause of that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But anyway, think about this. Necrosis, hemorrhage, and fibrin thrombi in the uteroplacental area, adrenal gland, and the kidney. And that's really what you, can, what you generally will see. You can see fibrin thrombi elsewhere, which is DIC. And that's what humans often get, too, is DIC. I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Diabetes mellitus, I said it was, uh, there's a colony of these 
Uh, in the guinea pig, there's also, uh, this is a model in the Chinese hamster, diabetes mellitus. Again, it causes juvenile diabetes. And I'll show you how un unremarkable the pathology is. This is a very high magnification of an islet of Langerhans. And what I'm supposed to be showing you here is the four things that are reported to occur with the beta cells. Shrunken eosinophilic cytoplasm with some vacuolation and pycnotic nuclei. And you know, if you saw this on your desk, you would never say this animal's diabetic because that's very, these changes are very subjective. You'd have to have good controls in my mind and maybe even do EM to show that. But that's what's reported with the Chinese hamster model. Uh, there's supposedly a microangiopathy, which again is very difficult to evaluate histopathologically. And a few miscellaneous conditions and that will be done. Polycystic disease, I'm aware of two reports of this in literature. Uh, the first report said that this occurred in a significant number of animals and a significant number of animals had cysts in multiple organs. Liver was the most common. And many animals had it in more than one organ, and the epididymis was another site, the pancreas is another site, uh, the seminal vesicles in males, again, uh, is where they found these. And they thought, their conclusion was that this kind of resembled polycystic disease in people. The problem is the table indicated that there was a higher percentage of this in the oldest animals as compared to the mid-age uh, animals. So I, you know, what causes this, I don't think anybody knows. Is this congenital or acquired? That's the basic problem. I suppose if you think it's congenital, you might be able to say it's an uh, animal model of polycystic disease in people. But as far as hamsters go, I don't think this is a very important disease. It's just that you recognize what it looks like. Uh, here is a liver with multiple cysts, very thin wall containing abundant uh, clear to yellow fluid. And if you look at it microscopically, this is liver again, and this is the cyst. Some of the contents remains. It's lined by an epithelium, which is flattened. Here that epithelium is again, the cyst lumen here. And it was said that, off, that sometimes these epithelial cells were contiguous with bile duct epithelial cells. And I suppose that makes sense that there is somehow a disruption of the patency of bile ducts where you get these cysts form. This is a testicle. Male hamster, here's the epididymis here, the head of the epididymis, and there are cysts in there. And here they are again. They're not filled with uh, semen. They are filled with a kind of a eosinophilic flocculent material. Polycystic disease. And when I say poly, they generally, I think, are referring to multiple organ systems. Amyloidosis, this is a very common problem in hamsters. Uh, almost any age animal is going to get some amyloid, any age hamster, but if you give them infections at a young age, you'll develop amyloid very early and they'll develop very serious uh, accumul or large accumulations of this. And like I said, the, the most common presentation in my mind is they get ascites and anasarca. That's how you see that. And I can explain that, I think, because I think First of all, the liver is usually involved, which means that uh, the animals uh, don't produce as much protein, so you probably have a hypoalbuminemia with that. And the second thing is I think that you, you follow up the kidney because there's always some in the glomerular tufts as well. <clears throat> and here are some kidneys, severe case, relatively normal kidneys here. And here are two that have a very severe uh, case of amyloidosis. And if you, you know, you could probably call it that on this basis, but you can do the thing with Lugol's where you put the iodine, alcoholic iodine on it, and it turns brown, and you put, add sulfuric acid, and it turns uh, blue. Uh, you can do that grossly. And here is a glomerulus, very high magnification tubule here, but this is the glomerulus <coughs> right here. The tuft is right in here. And all this pink stuff, this amorphous pink stuff is amyloid. Very severe case of it. Amyloid is most commonly seen in the kidneys, the liver, the spleen, and the adrenal glands. And it always starts around very small vessels, capillaries. That's why it's so readily seen in the kidneys, because there's such a big component of capillary bed in this tissue. And here it is with a crystal violet. Most people use a Congo red, which would turn this kind of an orange color. And then if you use polarized light, you can see an apple green birefringence. That's a typical 
stain that's used. I just threw this one in here to show you what a crystal violet would do because it causes metaplasia. Crystal violet, this is kind of a magenta color. It turns from a, a violet color to a more magenta color. Metaplasia, excuse me, not metaplasia, uh, metachromia. Met metachromia. Metachromia is what I want to say. Again, amyloid. And here it is in the red pulp of the spleen. Uh, it's balled up. I mean, you look at this, you'd say, well, this is this space. And I guess you can't really see it without focusing up and down. But this is the way it usually looks in the spleen. It's kind of, I call it balled up material. It doesn't look like collagen here. I think this is pretty good evidence for amyloid. But sometimes you don't know, and you have to do a multiplicity of stains to make sure that you've got amyloid. Atrial thrombosis. This is a common problem in aged uh, hamsters. I just saw it a couple rats. So coincidentally, they had two old fisher rats that uh, died mysteriously, and I posted them, and they both had uh, very large uh, uh, interstitial adenomas of the testicle, but both also had atrial thromboses and lots of hydrothorax. So it's kind of coincidental why two in a row would have both those lesions. But hamsters will get this, and it's uh, more commonly seen in females and more commonly and seen earlier in females. And there's a very high incidence of this uh, in certain studies that have been done in aged hamsters. And no one knows exactly why this occurs. Is there a, a, a coagulation problem, or is there actually a lesion problem in the heart of the animal? Because there is a consumptive coagulopathy. So which comes first is the question here. I think people think there's probably a cardiomyopathy of some kind which precipitates this problem, and then there's a coagulopathy with it. Anyway, it's more common in females, and it's earlier in females. And here are three hearts above and three, two down below. And which ones are normal and which one's not? Well, this row is normal, and this row is abnormal. And you can compare the size of the atria here. Much bigger. This one looks like it's got a white material in it. These don't necessarily. But the atria are much smaller here, and then these Ventricles look more rounded, so there's ventricular <coughs> hypertrophies associated with the two. So these are the normals, and these are the abnormals with atrial thrombosis. And a cross section, longitudinal cross section, shows that the left atrium here and left atrium in here. And this is the left ventricular free wall, septum, right ventricular free wall here. And I think in the studies, 87% occur in the left atria alone, 12% occur in both atria. That's what, 99? I must be off a little bit. I think some of them have it only in the right atrium. As I recall, it must be 1%, something like that. But mostly they're in the left atrium uh, by themselves. And here's what one of those looks like. It's kind of hard to get oriented here. This is the atrium. The wall is very thin right at this point, And you don't see any of the intertrabecular parts at all. Uh, one report says these start at the apex of the auricle or the atrium. I really don't know about that because the ones I've seen microscopically don't seem to start there. They seem to start in the part that has the largest uh, area in, in the body of the atrium. But this is typical for these concentric rings. And what's seen oftentimes is, in the rats I saw this too, is that the part that's farthest away from the entrance to the atrium has got what almost looks like fibrous connective tissue proliferation in there and mineral which meant to me that that was an old area. It was almost like the fibrin was being pre replaced by fibrous connective tissue. So if the, you can sometimes see that, I think, in the hamster hearts, too, where you see fibrous connective tissue in the clot itself and maybe some mineral deposition. And these things take a while to develop. In some of these hamsters, you can see clinical signs up to 10 days to two weeks in advance of death. They get uh, hyperpnic or dyspneic and cyanotic. They have an obvious problem. And what the problem is, is they're not pumping the blood adequately through the bloodstream. I mean, it, they've got a thrombotic process that started already interfering with blood flow, and it takes a while for them to actually <coughs> die. And so that's, you can actually recognize this condition clinically. They just don't arrive dead on the necropsy table in the morning, and uh, no explanation as to why they're dead. Spontaneous hemorrhagic necrosis of the CNS of fetal hamsters. Again, this was recognized maybe 15 years ago. Uh, the first reports came out, did not understand the etiology. They thought it was virus. They happened to be doing a lot of viral research. But it was, it was multiple shipments of animals in a facility. They did a beautiful job describing the pathology. But at the time, 
the etiology was rec not recognized. Now we know that the etiology of this is vitamin E deficiency, vitamin E selenium deficiency. And it's thought to be a vascular problem. And what was seen, these are 13 to 14 day old fetuses, and what I'm trying to demonstrate is that in the calvarium there's hemorrhage as well as in the spinal column, spinal canal here that you can see blood. Here it's not really seen, but here's more hemorrhage again. This is seen in some of these animals. Uh, if these animals were born alive, they were cannibalized very quickly. So, you know, they were pretty close to parturition here at 13 or 14 days. But that was one thing that was seen. And here are some other changes. Now here, the nose of the fetal hamster is here. This is the dome of the head right here. The spinal cord would be going back here. Here's the mouth and sinuses down here. What we're looking at is the cortical mantle of the brain. Where this is a parasagittal section. We're taking a parasagittal section through the head, and this is a developing ventricle here, a ventricle, particular space, and here as well, and this is a cortical mantle. And what one can see is that there is blood in this, in this space. The mantle contains some red areas here, which is blood, and there are some blue areas here, which are reparative processes. And I'll go through the, edi the pathogenesis of this in a second. The lesions started in this area, went posterior, sometimes involved the spinal cord sometimes involved the retina as well. And the higher magnification shows again the changes that are seen and basically what they are is edema comes first, which you can't really see here, then necrosis, then hemorrhage, then neuroepithelial rosettes which are reparative and all of those are seen here and I'll go through the steps. Here's the first change that was seen is edema of the developing mantle followed by necrosis, the cellular debris is here, all the chiroerectic debris is readily seen here, followed by hemorrhage, which is seen right here, is in that area now, and here are the neuroepithelial rosettes, which are the next stage, abundant neuroepithelial rosettes, which are reparative. No inflammatory cells as we know them were present in this process at all, or are present in it. And this is a vascular problem, and here's abundant blood in the ventricle itself. In the severe cases, it also affects the spinal cord. Here is the vertebral column here. Here is the base of the vertebral column, the individual vertebrae. Here is the dorsal processes right here, and here is the spinal cord. And you can see there is dissolution of that cord going all the way back. And here is the eye. And the retina is affected with edema and necrosis, but there was no hemorrhage seen and no epithelial rosettes either. And here's a higher magnification. Here's the retinal pigment of the epithelium here. Here's the retinum, retina, and here is this necrosis with the edema as well. So if you give these animals high levels of corn oil or linoleic acid, you can induce this. If you give them vitamin E, high levels of that, you can prevent it. So I think it's basically uh, concluded now that this is a vitamin E selenium deficiency. And it was found that the dams, some of the dams had myopathy and some of the fetuses also had myopathy which is what we normally think of with vitamin E selenium. So this is another uh, animal that has a vitamin E problem. Hepatic cirrhosis, uh, I thought at one time here a year or two ago that this was an extinct entity but I was told that it's not, there, there's still some colonies that have this problem. Uh, some colonies reported a 20 percent incident that I read last night, there's one colony that said they had a 50 percent incidence of this. And no one knows why they're getting it. There was some thought about uh, mycotoxins, but uh, the, I don't think mycotoxins are a part of it. Uh, no one seems to know why, but middle-aged animals will get it as well as older age animals. And here's the liver from one of those. It doesn't look to be too nodular on the surface, not lumpy bumpy as we often think of cirrhosis. But if you look at it on cut section, you can see how much fibrosis there is in here. I mean the nodule, the parenchyma is probably reduced 50 percent and the other 50 percent is comprised of these hyaluronized bands of fibrous connective tissue. And that was one thing that was pointed out is these nodules are not really regenerative nodules. Now normally with cirrhosis you say well there's necrosis, ongoing necrosis of a parenchyma. The animal responds by repairing that with fibrosis but then responds with regeneration with nodules. And so that was the thing about cirrhosis is you've got necrosis with re regeneration of uh, fibrous connective tissue proliferation, bile duct reduplication, and inflammation. Well, that's really not what's happening here. This is probably not a good, not appropriate to call cirrhosis. 
it seems as though these hyalinized bands just course, uh, course between lobules. There really isn't much regeneration here. It's very hyalinized, and there isn't very much bile duct reduplication either. So here you can see the bands really nicely. It doesn't seem like there's much inflammation, although here there's some hypercellularity. Could be inflammation and bile ducts are both, and I think it is both in here. There's one more picture showing that, yes. Uh, this one here, there is some necrosis here. There's some neutrophils that are degenerating. Here is the uh, fibrous connective tissue band. There are bile ducts here. I picked this out as worse because I wanted to try and demonstrate all the thing, classic things for cirrhosis, but I really did the wrong thing because this is really not typical. And the reason is, and one author said that he's convinced that this is not uh, aflatoxin induced because aflatoxicosis has a very severe bile duct reduplication, and that is never seen with this condition. And that was a good point, I think. And knowledge of regeneration, he said, is not present here, whereas it often is with the other ones. So I, th I think that I learned a lot from him and his observations, and I agree now that I look at these slides again. Nonspecific intranuclear inclusions of the liver. Uh, these can be seen in many species. You should know what these are. Uh, don't try and make these into viral inclusions, although you can't rule it out, I guess, unless you look around. But here's a hepatocyte nucleus with this these synophilic structure in the middle say, well, it's too big for a nucleolus, it must be a viral inclusion. Be wary, and particularly if you see them right next to the nuclear membrane. They are, they are invaginations of the nuclear membrane into the nucleus with cytoplasm that's gotten in there. So be careful about these things. And these are seen, I think, uh, in over, like, they have to be certain age. These develop with time, put it that way. The older the animal, the more common you're going to find, commonly going to find these. The other one here is intracytoplasmic, non-glycogenic inclusions, liver. Again, be aware what these are. Two of them here, just to see a halo here with an eosinophilic uh, structure. Here's another halo with an eosinophilic structure off to the side. You might wonder what this is. Well, now I think most people think that these are uh, not microsomal, but lysosomal. Uh, Congested lysosomes, I guess you could say, or constipated lysosomes or whatever. These are, excuse me, PS positive with and without diastase, which means that they're non-glycogen. That's important right there. But they're also Sudan back positive, which demonstrates that there is lipid material in them. So most people think that these are lysosomal structures. Should be aware. And in these animals, again, they are seen in animals that have hepatic damage of some kind or another, which makes a lot of sense. And trophoblastic giant cells, I talked about those in guinea pigs. The trophoblastic giant cells is the outer layer of the blastocyst. They invade the endometrium and set up the placenta. And the guinea pig, there's one layer of them, and they went out into the myometrium. In people and in chinchillas, they go lots of places. And in hamsters, they go lots of places too. They invade the arterial system. They get into the bloodstream of the dam. And in the hamster, they go to the arterioles around the uterus and around the ovary. And this is an arterial here, thin-walled, lined by very, very large cells with very, very large nuclei. Here's another example here. Here's the normal thickness of the arterial wall. And here is a nucleus here with a great big cell, great big cell here. Another one here, this has got a nucleus in it. If you don't have a nucleus in here, you should be puzzled as to what these are, because without the nucleus, it's very difficult to discern that they're even cells. And here is a good one in a chinchilla, just to show you what these can look like. We're in the lung now. This is an alveolar space here. And here's an alveolar space that's filled with one cell. And here is another area in a chinchilla lung showing one villus, a villus here, a villus, there are what, three or four of them here that are filled with this material, which you, the unknowing, would say, gee, that's pretty severe focal edema, or that's fibrin or something. That's, those are trophoblastic giant cells. And in women, these are very important because they can cause death. I'm not aware of any deaths occurring in hamsters or in guinea pigs from this, but be aware of what trophoblastic giant cells are. And the last entity that I have is cecal mucosal hyperplasia. I said it was reported in lab animal science uh, about eight or 10 years ago by the same people, I believe, that did the work on atypical iliac hyperplasia. And they had a large 
outbreak of this in a breeding colony where 80% mortality in the weaning animals. And these are slides from that outbreak. Here's a normal height of the cecum, by the way, of a hamster. You can see it's not that high. And here's what they saw, same magnification, three to four X thickness, a lot of mitotic figures in the crypts, a lot of mitotic figures up the crypt wall. They aren't differentiating into typical goblet cells here. There's some necrosis up here. There's, there's some inflammation here as well. At the time, they could not demonstrate any organisms at all within these epithelial cells using the same reagents they use in their other experimental work. And now there's another report of this uh, in the literature. And now with Clostridium difficile out there, I'm just wondering if that wasn't what was going on here, although there's no hemorrhage or congestion. So it does look a little bit different. But it could be that entity. And uh, anyway, I like that. I'm glad I'm ending on this. The etiology this is unknown, but uh, it points out again the biggest problem I think in hamsters are these enteridides, where all of a sudden we have a multiplicity of bacteria that are getting involved in there, and they're very difficult to diagnose.